Welcome to Cornerstone's Walking with God equipping class. This is Scott. I'll be hosting today's session. With me, I've got Brian. Hi. Who will be our main instructor today. And Matt is here as well. Hello. Matt will be our contributor. This equipping class is, is designed really to teach you how to live the basic Christian life. Uh, we, we've summarized the components of that basic Christian life in the discipleship pathway, which you may be familiar with. Um, whether you are or not, uh, it, if you have the handouts in front of you, if you have the notes, um, that can be helpful. You can see the um, discipleship pathway depicted there and follow along as, as we go. But as we talk about the, the pathway in general, why don't we start with, uh, Brian, can you just explain where the pathway came from? Yeah, I think what we did is we we noticed that for a lot of people, I think ourselves included, um, the Christian life can feel really overwhelming. It feels like you're being pulled in a lot of different directions, or you're never really sure exactly what you should be doing at any given moment in time. And so that can be overwhelming. It can make you really frustrated. It can make you discouraged. It can make you kind of go numb and be apathetic towards Christian growth. There's a lot of ways that being overwhelmed is negative for the Christian life. And so what we try to do is figure out how can we get our arms around the Christian life in such a way that it's not overwhelming, but it's encouraging or maybe even inspiring. That was the idea. And so we took like, what was it, a year and a half? <laughs> a year and a half literally in this room. Yeah, in the room we're in right now. And we looked at the Bible and we said, so, you know, what is the basic Christian life? Are, are there categories that can organize all the things the Bible tells us to do in that way that makes it encouraging and not overwhelming. And we came up with with this pathway, with these categories that we think show us the basic Christian life that we all should be pursuing and living and enjoying. That's that's right. It took us a year and a half to come up with six categories. <laughs> Technically, there's eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So, Matt, can you just walk us through those different categories? What what what, what are the main? Why don't, you, why don't you start with what are the main six? Yeah. So, um, for us, in Matthew 22, Jesus kind of summarizes these commandments for us um, and gives us the greatest commandment as what Christians are called to obey. Um, that is to love God and to love people. And so, the the six main uh, categories that we have. The first three correspond with loving God. Those are Bible, um, which is listening to and learning from God in his word. Prayer, which is speaking and relating to God in prayer. And then heart work, which is the third um, category, which is internalizing and applying what God um, has said. And so those three categories correspond to how we're called to love God and what it means to obey that commandment to love God. And then the second three categories are um, the categories that cover loving people or loving your neighbor uh, more familiarly. Uh, And those are community, which is your loving relationships with other Christians, and then mission, which is your loving relationships with non-Christians, and calling, um, which is a, a category that we use to describe what it means to love others through our unique roles and responsibilities that we have been um, given by God. So those are the main six categories, right? Bible, prayer, heart work, community, mission, calling, the ways we walk with God and walk in the world. And But you said there were eight, technically. <laughs> there are eight. There, there are, and, and, and that's because... <clears throat> All of that is motivated by the gospel, right? We, we can read our Bibles, we could pray, we could share the gospel with others for all sorts of different motivations, but, but in, in Scripture and what God's given us in the gospel, He's given us the motivation of His grace that, that provides the impetus and the drive to dig into every one of these areas. And, and all of this really has a trajectory, and the trajectory is that it, it is growing us towards Christ-likeness. We, we're becoming more and more and more like Christ as we walk with God and as we walk in the world. So, so that's the pathway. And, and here's how this class is going to work. We're, we're going to spend 12 weeks on walking with God, and that's what this class is for. There'll be a, a separate 12-week class on walking in the world. We're going to be doing it in a podcast format uh, with meetings for discussion on, on each component of the discipleship pathway. So after four sessions on the Bible, we will meet together and discuss together um, what we've heard, what we've listened to, and kind of take it it deeper. Um, And you should have notes that you can use and follow along for reference. You can follow along while you listen or for reference later as you look back on it. Let's get started. And we're talking about walking with God, loving God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. 
I mean, Brian, do, do you think there's a disconnect between the relationship with God people want to have and the one that they uh, are actually experiencing? Yeah, I think that's really, really common um, and probably more common than most people think. I think a lot of people, what they want is something personal, um, something real, uh, not just something that they know, sort of a, a knowledge-based idea of God that feels still kind of cold and distant, what, what they want, and that's kind of why we called this class Walking with God, what they want to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. They want their life to be a walk with God in a way that they can feel is somewhat tangible, somewhat something they experience, you know, on a daily basis. And a lot of times people think that's what everyone else is experiencing, um, sometimes based on maybe the songs that get sung in certain Christian circles or conversations they have with other people, even some stuff they would read or see online, like that there's this sense that everyone has this relationship with God that's just so deep and so emotional and so tangible and so real. But that's not the reality for most people. Um, and so I, I think there is a gen, genuine disconnect for a lot of people between what they think uh, it should be like and their lived experience of a relationship with God. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the um, – this is at the core of what it means that Christianity is a relationship, right? Yeah. Not just a religion, but I think sometimes people feel a tension. We're like, well, okay, I know it's supposed to be a relationship, but how do I make that happen? How do I actually – actually live that out. Yeah. But I think, I think it's clear and, and very helpful um, and hopeful for people to know that the thing that people tend to want, obviously everyone needs to adjust some of the things that they want or assume a relationship with God should be like, um, like in any relationship. But the thing that people tend to want, that idea of reality, of a sense of God's presence and a sense of walking with him throughout their days, that's something God wants for us. And that's a really important thing to recognize and, and to push forward in people's lives. When you look at like even the phrase eternal life in scripture, so you go to like John 17, three, and you have Jesus saying like, this is eternal life, mm -hmm. that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Right. And then you tie that together with things like Romans six in six twenty three. it says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so what you see is that um, throughout Scripture, the idea of Jesus purchasing eternal life for us is not purchasing just eternal life in the sense that, well, we get to go to heaven forever, like it's eternal in length. It's also purchasing for us the ability to really know God in a personal, relational way. And so that's why someone like J.I. Packer would say that Christians, for Christians, the main business you're here for is to know God. And, and that changes in a lot of ways the way you look at the Bible. So you begin to read the Bible a little differently, noticing that this is sort of that, that important focal point of what Jesus came to do for us. So you see, you know, we're created to know God, and then we're saved so we might know God. And the promise of eternity is not just in length, but that we'll know God perfectly forever. And so Christ's death and resurrection is to give us eternal life, that eternal life is about knowing God. Like this becomes something that isn't just icing on the Christian cake. Um, on, on the Christian life. This has become something that's really central to who we are as Christians. That's pretty cool that that's something God wants for us, this thing that you want for yourself as a Christian. Hmm. That's, that's so good. And and because knowing God is at the heart of that relationship, it's essentially at the heart of the Christian life. So l let's explore that a little bit more. I mean, what, what does it mean to know God? I mean, it sounds good. Right? It sounds yeah. it sounds like something we do want, but what does that mean? And it's one of those things that we say a lot, and we can say a lot, but sometimes we don't really explain what we mean. Um, I mean, Matt, for you, like, what, what does it mean to know God? Yeah, I think Brian was um, really touching on a lot of the, the core pieces of what it means to know God. First and foremost, I think knowing God is, is personal. It's something that is uh, different than just knowing a bunch of facts about a, a person. It's, it's not something cold. Um, you know, knowing God isn't simply a few facts or details uh, or, or some sort of academic exercise. It's not something that I, I think is uh, can sometimes be viewed as almost like a, a textbook, like you're just learning information and you're digesting certain uh, specific details. But the reality is that uh, it's more like having a relationship with a friend or someone in your family. It's something personal and intimate. It's knowing who he is in a close a relational kind of way. Um, and so first and foremost, I think of knowing God as something that's personal above all else. 
Yeah, I think that, that personal nature um, of that relationship, of knowing God, is what leads to other really important factors um, that, that God intends when he talks about knowing him as being so important. I, the idea I alluded to earlier of you know, knowing God being central, like there's a way that I think is, is common where, where we, and a lot, of, a lot of Christians will look at the idea of knowing God, the idea of walking with him daily, of having that sense of personal knowledge as something that sort of comes later on in the Christian life or is sort of icing on the cake. You know, it's like, well, the, the Christianity is sort of this other stuff. But if I get really holy or really want to kind of go get extra credit, I can try and like know God personally or experience his presence. But th- clearly in the Bible, it's a central thing. Like this isn't something you like might get to one day. This right. is this is the middle of it. Um, and you see that even in the Old Testament, it's like Hosea 6 says, you know, God says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So you have God taking something that he does care about, like sacrifices and offerings and saying, but there's something even more important than that. Those aren't the central thing. The knowledge of me is the central thing. Hmm. And so that becomes really, really huge and pivotal for us to understand. And that is tied to the idea that if it's so, the reason it's so central and the reason that personal nature of it is central is because when you combine something central with something personal, you get something powerful. Hmm. So this becomes then not just like a nice experience we can have here and there of sort of the, the presence of God and the love of God, which is one of those things I said earlier, like it's not just whatever you want it to be. It's actually bigger than oftentimes you want it to be. This is really powerful. And so, for example, like Jesus says, uh, in the book of John, you know, abide in me, you know, and I in you, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Hmm. And so there's this sense that the knowledge of God, that abiding, that, that, uh, that relational dynamic between a believer and the God who created and saved him or her is really potent in your life. It's bigger than a feeling here or there. It's central, it's personal, and it's powerful. Yeah, I think related to that, just kind of connecting to the idea of its centrality and thinking about that Hosea passage, I I think about what that kind of means then is that every component of the Christian life kind of functions to serve this purpose of knowing God. It's central to what we do. Uh, Our practice as Christians is for the purpose of knowing God in that way. And it's to me, that's kind of crazy because it means that you can do all sorts of really, really good, really Christian things. And if they're not done as a piece of your knowledge of God, as a piece of your relationship with God flowing out of who he is and what he's done for you in that relational sense, that there's probably holes in what you're doing, mm. that you might be missing it. You have the icing, but not the cake. And we tend to flip that. Hmm. Yeah, that's... A- both powerful and convicting. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, even even just to think about. I mean, so I, I know you, Matt touched on it actually uh, a little bit, but but I, I've heard you talk a lot about how our relationship with God is analogous to a relationship with another person, mm-hmm. right? To a relationship with you and me. Now, he's not here, right? Right? Like he's, he doesn't have a microphone <laughs> yeah. in front of him, so I can, he's can't here. talk to him like that. Uh, <laughs> dang it, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, theology, please. <laughs> <laughs> but can, can, can you can you uh, can, can you just um, I don't know, describe a little bit about maybe some of those similarities and and why that's it's such a helpful even analogy for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I th- you're right, and it's important to say um, because some of some of the things that we say or that you hear get said in some Christian circles make it sound like God is here, you know, and you can feel His arms around you and all these things. Um, it's it's helpful to know there are differences. Like if you can't say. God doesn't, isn't going to call you and say, meet me at the Starbucks. And you walk in and you see, oh, there he is at the corner table. Like, that's not... Like, physically. Yeah, like, you can't, like, recognize him because of, you know, his height or, like, or, like, or these sorts of things. long, flowing hair. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and the sheep in his hands. I would assume yeah. he would be short like me if he was just a, a thought. The, all, all good reasons why God did not do that. Um, the, uh, but, but, so there, there are differences. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't also really important similarities. And because theologically and biblically, we understand God is a person, not a force, then the way you get to know a person um, is going to also apply to the way you get to know God, who's a person. So there are definitely going to be some big similarities. Yeah. And I think thinking in that context, it's a relationship. It's a personal relationship. Some of the similarities that kind of jump out to me, I think about the fact that in a relationship with another person, to cultivate that relationship, you listen to them. 
You listen to them as they speak, as they share, as they share who they are and what's important to them, what matters to them, as they share what's going on in, in their life. You That's part of what it means to be in a relationship, part of what it means to be in a friendship. You also um, learn about the person. You know, in, in a relationship, you don't know everything immediately. You don't know everything about who they are. You learn about people over time, especially um, the closest relationships in our lives, I think we sometimes think you've exhausted everything you could know about somebody, but it's not true. Over time, you le- you keep learning about a person decades and decades later after cultivating this kind of relationship with them. And that's uh, similar for God as well. And And just like listening, you hear them speak, you also speak to them and you share about your life and what's going on in your life and what's going on in your heart and who you are. And um, there's this relational component that I think the analogy for me, actually, Brian, when I first heard you you share this analogy of just, comp- I know it's such a simple one, but it's actually really powerful, I think, in a lot of ways to help me understand what a relationship with God is supposed to be, the kind of personal interaction that we're called to have with God as Christians. Well, and, and, and the implications of the relationship are, are there as well, right? Like, so it's not just that you're learning and listening and and and, and, and talking to each other, but that the existence of one another in your lives, like that changes you. Right. As as I have a relationship with my wife, as a relationship with my kids, as a relationship with my friends, as I have a relationship with my family, like each new relationship that enters into my life, it my life kind of changes a bit like right. around them, right? The, the choices I make change. I, I take them into consideration now. And, it, and so, so they have an impact on me. But not only that, but they, they also it also changes me even in a deeper way, right? The more time you spend with people, I mean, I, this is why my, uh, my mom was cared so much about who my junior high friends were, right? <laughs> right? Like she knew that the people you spend time around, like it has an impact on you. It, 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 it changes you. It changes the way you view the world. It changes the way you speak. It changes the way you act. And so a relationship by necessity uh, trans- really transforms you. Yeah. And, and if, if you notice, like as you put these things together that we would say are fundamental to getting to know someone else, to being in a relationship with them, you actually end up having the top of the discipleship pathway. So, so if you were to sort of write these on a whiteboard, you know, well, we got to listen and, and we've got to learn and we speak to them, you get the the Bible prayer and heart work of the, path, of the pathway in such a way that you, Bible is listening to and learning from God's word. You know, it, it's a means of listening, of getting to know him. Prayer is speaking and relating to him. You're talking, you're, you're sharing who you are with him. And then heart work is essentially internalizing and applying what God said. It's being transformed by the relationship. And so what you have when you put all this together is, is that God, his central, powerful, personal desire for us is to know him in that way. And the way we do that, the way that gets acted out is in Bible prayer and heart work. So this pathway is us walking with God. It's us getting to know him. It's the path to the relationship that you want with God, but sometimes aren't sure how to get to. All right. So we're talking about walking with God, knowing him more deeply throughout our lives. And in our next session, we're going to start to look at the first category we'll cover, the Bible, right? Listening to and learning from God. But in the meantime, between this session and the next, I'd encourage you just to ask yourself a couple of these different application questions. First, what is your relationship with God like now? And in terms of knowing him, the way that we've been talking about, do you have a good relationship, a healthy relationship? Um, What are some ways that you know the relationship could be better? And secondly, what are some ways that you want to use this class to know God more? Essentially, what are some practical plans you can make to, to make that a reality? How do you think you can get the most out of this class. We're looking forward to spending the time together, and we hope you are too. We'll see you next time.